So let's get an idea of what exactly the technique we're going to be studying this week does. Now consider a data set that, is, that looks like what is shown on the screen. So you've got information on a number of people, a number of cases if you like. For each case, you've got the income, education, family size, and the type of car the person owns. And what we're trying to do here is to somehow predict the type of car that a person owns. Of course, for this data, we don't have to predict. We already know the type of car they own. But what we are trying to do here is to use this data to learn how to predict for some future cases for whom we know the income, education, and family size, but we don't know the type of car they own, we would like to be able to predict it. That's the idea. Of course, this information here is all made up just for illustration, uh, but that's what we are trying to do here. Now, one way to do this is to build some kind of models like a regression model or something to do the prediction, uh, in this case, the classification. But what we are going to do is look at a technique called decision trees. And that's the technique we'll be trying to do, trying to learn. Now, this is one of the more widely used data mining techniques. And it was invented pretty recently in the 80s. And it was invented in the artificial intelligence or the machine learning community rather than in the statistical community. Okay, let's jump in and take a look at what we are trying to do here. What we're really trying to do here is to observe the data and identify some underlying patterns. So for example, if you look at this data set, you find that people earning more than $200,000 or greater than or equal to $200,000 buy a luxury car, no matter what the values of the other variables are. Okay, so this is something we see. So we can say, well, if in the future, we come across somebody who's got an income of $200,000 or more, then we can predict that they will have a luxury car. So that is something that we learned from the data. Another is, we are also seeing that people with an income of less than equal to $30,000 buy a compact car, no matter what. That's another rule we can look at. For in between, for example, people whose income is between $100,000 and $200,000, then the kind of car they own depends on certain other characteristics. For example, we could see that if the family size is less than three, then these people also tend to own a luxury car. On the other hand, if the family size is greater than or equal to five, then they tend to go for an economy car and so on. Okay. So what we're trying to do is to examine the data and unearth rules that are hidden in the data. This is what we mean by decision rules. And that is the technique we're going to learn. Of course, in, in a real life situation, we're going to have not 10 or 15 records as shown here. We're going to have information, historical information on 10,000 cases or 5,000 cases. And we're going to have information about many different attributes, not just three or four attributes. And therefore, we would like to look at underlying patterns. We would like the computer to look, examine this data and identify certain hidden underlying rules. That is what this technique is all about. Okay, now we are talking about rules. So it's worthwhile thinking about what is the connection between this technique that we are going to study and association rules, which we studied last week. On the surface, both of them look like they're the same because they are trying to unearth rules. But there are some significant differences. With association rules, of course, we were looking at a very limited perspective. We were only looking for items that were co-occurring in baskets. That is what we were trying to say is if somebody buys X, what other item can we recommend for them? And the kind of data on which association rules work was very limited kind of data. It was more, it was just market basket data. Whereas the technique we're going to study this week, CART, well, is much more general. It works on general data sets and it is used for both classification and prediction. So for example, if we applied it to the example that we just saw in the last slide, we can apply it to classify people to find out what kind of cars they would be likely to own based on their other characteristics. That's a classification problem because we are trying to take all the people and simply divide them into people who will own a compact car, a luxury car, etc, uh, etc. Et that's a classification problem. But this technique 
is also applicable for prediction, quantitative prediction, which is to say what is going to be the price. So that is going to be a number rather than just putting data into buckets. It's used for both of them, but in the rest of this lecture, I'm going to look more closely at the classification aspect of it. The other aspect of it, the prediction aspect of it, we look at it later in the course. So the technique is called CART and the, what it stands for is classification and regression techniques. And therefore, they've got both classification and regression, which stands for classification and prediction. They, they've used the word regression to really indicate prediction. This word, the use of the word regression here has nothing to do with regression as used in traditional statistics. We'll be looking at that also later. So that's what this technique is all about. Classification and regression trees. That's what we're going to try and do. Before jumping into the technique itself, let's take a look at the output that the technique produces. Okay, so here you see an example of a situation where there was some data for a bank. And the bank is going to make loan offers to various people. And the bank wants to know what is the likelihood that a person with specific characteristics will either accept the loan offer or reject the loan offer. And they want to do this based on historical data for which they have information and they also know who accepted the loan and who didn't accept the loan offer. So the end result of that whole process might be what is called as a classification tree. And that is what you're seeing in the diagram here. Of course, why this is called a tree, we'll look at it later. So what this says is that if you take a person, first thing we want to do is to look at their income. And according to the data based on which the tree was built, what was found was that people whose income was less than or equal to $92,500 were not going to accept the loan. Zero says non-acceptors. Zero meaning they will not accept the loan. And what this is telling you is that of the data that the, that was used to build the model, there were 1,083 cases of people who had an income of less than or equal to $92,500. And the prediction for them, the classification for them is they will not accept the loan. Now, on the other hand, if the income is greater than or equal to $92,500, and it so happens that there were 417 such cases, then the decision is not so straightforward. It's not that they're all going to accept the loan offer, but it further depends upon their education level. So in the data set, the education level has been classified in some way. High school is one, probably undergrad is two, etc., etc. What this is still telling us is, if the education is less than or equal to 1.5, and they found 260 such cases, then it further depends upon the family size of the people. And if the family size is less than or equal to 2.5, then they will not accept the loan offer. And if the family size is greater than, two, incidentally, there were no cases where the family size was less than 2.5, so it doesn't really matter. If the family size is greater than or equal to 2.5, uh, then again, it depends upon the income. So originally, we started with an income of greater than 92.5, but again, if uh, the income is greater than 92.5, if the education is less than 1.5, family size is greater than 2.5, and then it says if the income is less than 116,000, then they will not accept the loan. If it's greater than 100, uh, 116,000, they will accept the loan. Okay, so that's really what the computer model has inferred by looking at the data. So it has examined the data and found that these are some underlying rules that could explain the data that was provided. So the idea is on the training data, we build this decision tree. Of course, the computer builds the decision tree. And then for future cases, if this model is found to be a good model on the validation data, on future cases, we can apply these rules to classify people. So for example, a new customer comes along we know their income, education, family, et cetera, et cetera, based on, let's say, a questionnaire that we gave them and they filled out. So we've got all of that information, but we're going to make them an offer and we don't know if they're going to accept the offer or not. 
So using this, we can make a classification as to whether a given person is going to be an acceptor or a non-acceptor. That's the whole idea. So we are just looking here at the tree itself and we've already gone through this. So the first branch shows you that if the income is less than or equal to 92.5, then the person is going to be a non-acceptor. On the other hand, if the income is greater than 92.5 and education is less than 1.5 and family size greater than 2.5 and income is greater than 116, then they're going to be an acceptor. So that's really what this means. So what we're trying to do here is to bring out the parallel between the tree that we have drawn here. We'll shortly look at why it's called a tree at the diagram that we have drawn here. And of course, what it really implies is a set of rules. So that's really what we're trying to do. And what we're going to do again here is to use the computer, use the classification and regression tree technique to input information to the computer. And the computer is going to build for us this decision tree. Of course, it's possible for us to condense the rule. For example, if it says income greater than 92.5 and again, it says income greater than 116, we could remove one of those and just say income is greater than 116 and education less than 1.5 and family size greater than 2.5, then accept it. So you could simplify the uh, rules generated by the computer. In fact, the uh, computer programs would also do the simplification themselves. So in this example now, what I would like you to do is to take a look at this diagram, pause the video and identify two more rules that you're able to infer from the diagram. I just want to make sure that you understand the diagram. So it's worthwhile for you to pause the video and identify two more rules, write down the rules and then probably go back and make, make sure that the rules you wrote down are actually correct with respect to the format of the rules that we wrote earlier. And incidentally, it's also worthwhile thinking about, given this diagram, how many rules are implied in this particular diagram? So once again, what I'd like you to do is to pause the video, think about it a little bit, and then we'll talk about it shortly. Okay. So one other rule could be, if the income is uh, greater than or equal to 92.5, education is greater than 1.5 and again income is less than 114.5 and credit card average is less than or equal to 2.95 then they will not accept okay so this is the rule that uh, that followed this particular path that I'm tracing with my cursor that's one rule another rule could of course we could come back here and look at this that is if the income is greater than or equal to 92.5 education is greater than 1.5 and then again, income is greater than 114.5, then they are likely to accept the loan, which is this. In other words, we can say if the income is greater than or equal to 114.5 and the education is greater than 1.5, they are likely to be acceptors. That could be another rule. Now, the other second question, which is how many rules are there in all? Well, essentially what we have to look at is the nodes which are at the very end of the tree. For example, that's that that node implies a rule this node implies a rule this node implies a rule etc etc so all the nodes below which there is nothing else each of those implies a complete rule so in this particular example we've got a total of 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 7 rules in this particular diagram Let's look at this tree once again and establish a little bit of terminology. Why is this called a tree in the first place? This hardly looks like a tree. But the reason they call this a tree, of course, is it's really an inverted tree. If you put it upside down, then you can see that it's sort of like a tree that is growing upwards, starting from the bottom. So for example, this might be the root, and then you've got a branch going here, another branch going here, and then further branchings. So that is why in mathematics, statistics, and so on, they call these kinds of structures as trees, even in computer science. They call these as trees, but of course, these are trees growing from top to bottom rather than the traditional trees that grow from bottom to top. Now, let's establish a little bit of terminology here. So, as I've just discussed, the first node on the very top is conventionally referred to as the root node for obvious reasons, because that's the root from which the tree is growing. 
and other nodes that you that I have just highlighted here they are called interior nodes and finally the nodes at the very bottom or at the very ends of the tree are called as leaf nodes because they are like leaves a tree ends well, for every branch the you know there is no further growth out of a leaf so these are called leaf nodes I'm just establishing the terminology because I might use it as we discuss things uh, in the future here in this lecture okay so what we are going to do then just to clarify is we are given some training data and we'll supply the training data as input to our computer to rattle and rattle will then build a decision tree for us based on the training data it uses the training data or the training partition to learn the model so that is the training phase once we've done that of course we're going to have new data which is the validation data and on the validation data we apply the tree that we've just built based on the training data and the model is going to give some results for the validation data and then we can compare the two results and get an idea of how good the model really was so in this particular example uh, the model was correct in two of the uh, in only one of the cases there are three cases shown here and the model is correct in only one of the cases which is the last case where the actual person in the validation data was an accept was not an acceptor and the model also said the person is not an acceptor but the model went wrong in the other two cases just to show you an example of what could happen okay so we build the model on the training partition and then we see how it performs on real data now incidentally the above diagram is just a simplification because in the cart technique the modeling process would actually be using both the training data and the validation partition both of those partitions the cart technique will actually use as we shall see shortly going forward and therefore the model performance we will evaluate using our third partition which is the test partition as we had discussed in our first lecture in some techniques you need only two partitions in other techniques you need three partitions it so happens that in the very first uh, supervised learning technique that we are studying we actually need to use the third partition but later on we'll also look at techniques which only use the training and the validation partition they don't use the test partition at all so as i have just discussed how good the model is depends upon how the model performs and towards the end of the lecture we'll make this criterion even more concrete so why use the cart technique it's a simple technique as you can see it's very easy to understand the cart technique you can explain it to people who are not mathematically oriented very easily so that's a very advantageous thing it's widely applicable in the sense that it has very little restrictions on the kind of data with which it can work it can work with numerical data uh, which is uh, you know ratio or interval scale data as predictors it can also work with uh, uh, with actual uh, numbers and categorical data anything can be in the predictors and similarly anything can be our target variable you could try use it for classification could also use it for prediction so in that sense it places very few restrictions on us it's a very widely applicable data and in certain areas especially in the field of prediction it gives very good performance compared to other techniques that are available for prediction so therefore uh, this is a very useful technique and it's also very widely used as i've already pointed out 